Our lesson on priorities today um, is uh, uh, just one of those, you know, again, the big rocks, things we, we need to keep in mind. And so our text is out of Matthew uh, chapter 16, verses 21 through 27. And if you're able, if you'd stand with me for the reading of God's word, we'll, we'll look at Matthew 16, beginning in verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be done unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of man. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, we do thank you this morning once again. Uh, uh, just a wonderful example, and not always a wonderful in behavior, but an example to us in the life of Peter. Lord, on just how he, he uh, reacts and speaks with his heart and how we find ourselves so often doing this morning. But Lord, I pray that uh, this morning we would uh, just understand that you do have a purpose, uh, and a purpose for every one of our personal lives. And Lord, that part of that life uh, might require some self-denial. Lord, I help, uh, pray that you would help us just realize that and give us the strength to do that as we look into your word this morning. Lord, help us to place your will as a first priority in our lives. We ask that in your blessing on our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> All right, so you get a little glimpse there of, of uh, the lesson that's going to come today on priorities and, and some uh, fairly strong language in there. It almost, I almost picture a, a physical altercation, you know, and he, you know, he says, you know, it sounds like he grabbed the Lord, you know, and, and the Lord turns, uh, you know, and some pretty serious stuff. So we're going to look at that. Uh, perhaps you've heard it said, quote, to get things done. You need to organize, deputize, and supervise. And, uh, you know, there's, there's some truth to that. And it's a management credo, and it's true. But there's a, probably a word that should precede those, and that is prioritize. Ooh, it is important to get things done, but it's even more important to get the right things done. Yeah. You know, sometimes people and... Uh, and you especially see it, I know, in your workplace. They get so busy getting things done, but they don't do the important stuff. Boy, Christian, we can do that in our lives, too. So we want to take a look. While there are many good things we can be doing, it's vital that we seek to do the best things. The best things. What is most astounding to me about the moment in Peter's life that we're about to learn from, which included a sharp rebuke from the Lord, is that it comes right on the heels of one of Peter's bold declarations of who he believed Jesus really was. We looked at that uh, a week or two ago when he said, uh, Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. So he recognized it and, you know, he saw that. And that's one of those great things about Peter, the first to, you know, say, you are the Christ. And then here we are just a little bit later and saying, grabbing him, you know, going, whoa. You know, I'd be afraid of getting my fingers singed a little bit, I think. Surely, this was a man who knew what was really important. But evidently, Peter had more to learn. The education of a disciple is never quite finished. And I'm sure we can relate to that. You know, no matter where we're at in our walk, we have more to learn. And Peter's learning that here 
every week we look at. <clears throat> In this passage, we learn that to live by the best priorities requires denying ourselves as we seek to do God's will for our lives. There on your bulletin, John 4, 34 says, Jesus saith unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. In other words, Jesus had a duty to do, and that's number one. He had devotion to duty. He had a duty. In all aspects of life, the Lord Jesus Christ is the paramount example for every believer. I hope we can all say amen to that. We see over and over. He is our example in everything. The central theme of all that he did on earth was simply this. He came to fulfill the will of his Father. At age 12, Jesus had told Mary and Joseph, there on your worksheet, Luke 2:49, and he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? In other words, you should know what I'm doing. You know I'm going to do what the father is. So um, he kept that priority throughout his time here. And some 20 years later, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he told his father, there on the bullet, uh, worksheet, John 17, 4, I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. So all that time, that's what he was here to do. A great respect is rightly given to those who fulfill their duty. It's a famous Civil War general, Robert E. Lee. And he said, quote, duty is the most sublime word in our language. Do your duty in all things. You cannot do more. You should never wish to do less, unquote. Christ personified that quote. We see that in his devotion to his duty. In letter A, Jesus had to go. He had to go. In our text of Matthew 16, 21, then it also says the same thing in Mark 31, 8, 31, Jesus taught his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. He must suffer, must be rejected, and must be killed. He knew every detail of the excruciating ordeal ahead of him. And yet Luke 9.51 adds a, another little detail there on the worksheet, Luke 9.51. And it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. This was literally his sacred duty. And he walked toward it with steadfast determination. You know, he just kept his focus like we talked about last week. Christians must understand there are times when Christ calls us to go places where we might have to suffer or pay a price for our faith. Though our home human reaction is to look for the easy way out, we can look at Jonah, for example, you know, seeking to do something a little easier. We must instead be willing to do the Lord's will no matter what. The Christian life will have times of hardship and suffering. Jesus promised that much to his disciples. Look there on the worksheet, John 16, 33. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Wow. So you're going to go through it, but keep your joy, because I'm with you. Patriarchs, prophets, and apostles all went through times of intense hardship. Severe and even deadly persecution carried on through the days of the early church. The Dark Ages, the Counter-Reformation, and into many countries today arriving and coming to our own U.S. of A. <clears throat> Second Timothy 3.12 there says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. I'm sorry. You know, that's just what the word tells us is going to happen. And we can expect it. The natural response to difficulty or danger is to flee from it. During the Crimean War, British cavalrymen were ordered to charge the Russian forces despite almost guaranteed death. These dedicated and obedient soldiers followed the command, not because they wanted to, because it was their duty. Alfred Lord Tennyson depicted their attitude in the poem, The Charge of the Light Brigade. 
It says, quote, theirs is not to make reply, theirs not to reason why, theirs but to do and die. Into the valley of death rode the 600. Wow, that's putting your duty first. Today, Christ is looking for faithful soldiers of the cross who will go where he wants them to go. When we follow the Lord's commands, we please our Savior. Paul describes this in 2 Timothy 2, there on the worksheet, verses 3 and 4. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Wow. So, soldier ahead for the Lord. <clears throat> This type of soldier will receive the ultimate praise, well done, a good and faithful servant. We all long for that. You know, a great example of devotion to duty uh, was in most of our lifetimes <clears throat> in the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. You wouldn't believe that just about 20 years ago. I was looking at it and I go, wow, it seems like it was just a few years ago. That's so embedded in our, our vision, I guess, in our memory. Over 400 firefighters and law enforcement officers gave their lives at the World Trade Center in New York City. The vast majority were not there in the normal course of their day, but were responding in a crisis to the call of duty. While the Twin Towers inhabitants were fleeing, these heroes deliberately ran into danger to do all they could to save lives. Carrying all the rescue equipment possible, they rushed up the stairwells that others were rushing down. They could not have explained why. They didn't stop to think about it. It was simply their job, and they did it with full acceptance of the risks. And I think one of the good things that came out of that day, if there can be any good, is that we really have come to recognize the first responders a lot more and appreciate them. And they, they've certainly earned that. Uh, that day when they did that. The Lord's plan for our life may lead us into danger, persecution, or even death. Christ knew that obeying the Father would require his death on the cross, yet he still went. And in his devotion to duty, letter B, Jesus had to die. Jesus had to die. That was his duty. Throughout time, God has required death in order for there to be life. Since Genesis 3, when God slew an innocent animal to provide a covering for Adam and Eve, blood has been the only way of salvation. We see that uh, on, uh, in Hebrews 9.22 on the worksheet. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Jesus' mission on earth was to die, to shed his pure and innocent blood for the sin of mankind. Had he refused, we couldn't have been forgiven our sin, our sin and we would die without hope. A couple of verses there on the worksheet about that, Romans 5, 8 through 10. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. In John 12, verses 23 and 4. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Thank you, Jesus, for staying faithful to your call and your purpose. Christ knew there'd be no salvation without a sacrifice. In his song, 10,000 Angels, Ray Overholt was scripturally correct when he wrote that Christ could have called 10,000 angels to free him, but instead went willingly to his death. Matthew 26, verses 53 and 4 there say, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled, that thus it must be? Wow. 
You know, we like calling in the reinforcements as quick as we can, amen? But his duty was to suffer on the cross. Christ lived and died fulfilling scripture. This was one reason he had to go to the cross. Jesus can be seen on every page of the Old Testament, but one of the most vivid passages depicting him is in Isaiah 53, centuries before the cross, 700 years. The prophet Isaiah wrote of this Lamb of God who would take away our sins. It's all there on the worksheet, Isaiah 53, 4 through 10. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Wow. 700, you know, it's hard to imagine us, imagine, you know, even the founding of our country 200 years ago. And yet Isaiah just nailed it word for word. On Jesus, Jesus fulfilled it, which is the scripture that he had to fulfill. Jesus was the one depicted in this passage, and Jesus fulfilled the prophecy when he was crucified. The Lord was committed to fulfilling his duty to die on the cross, but Satan was determined to use any opportunity he could to deter the Lord from going. And Satan wants to deter us, and I hope we all realize that. So then we have to fight against, number two, the distraction from duty. Lots of distraction from duty. Satan will use anything to dissuade us and distract us from what we ought to do. If he can't get us to go against God totally, he'll settle for getting us off track. Just that little start to veer. Even if only a, a little bit. Sometimes the distractions are obvious and easier to, com to combat against. Other times they are subtle. But sometimes those distractions come from people who are even close or even genuinely love us. In his classic devotional work, My Utmost for His Highest, Oswald Chambers said, The great enemy of the life of faith in God is not sin, but the good which is not good enough. The good is always the enemy of the best. Unquote. Wow. The devil may not try to ensnare us with a gross sin, if he can just distract, detract us, distract us from the Lord's will for our life, he has succeeded. I'm going to repeat that. The devil may not try to ensnare us with a gross sin. If he can just distract us from the Lord's will for our life, he has succeeded. The scripture makes clear the importance of our staying on course in our lives. On your worksheet, Proverbs 4, 20 through 27. My son, attend to my words, incline thine ears unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes, keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are, the, they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a froward mouth and perverse lips, put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand, nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. In other words, straight ahead. Don't start veering off course. 
you know, last night during prayer, and uh, we uh, just had some good stuff. And the, and the word of the day was, or the, the verse for the day, Proverbs 21, 21, along those lines, said, He that followeth after righteousness and mercy, in other words, I'm following after righteousness and mercy. I, that's the path I want to be on. But, and it says, findeth, he that do that, findeth life, righteousness and honor. I thought, wow, saying the same thing. You know, if we follow that, what do we get? We're going to find life, obviously, et eternal life. And we'll find that righteousness if we're after it. And then honor, the honor of our Lord Jesus Christ. Come into my kingdom. Wow, I love that. Well, you need to stay after it, to stay on that path. As Jesus pre pre prepared to fulfill the Father's will at the cross, the devil tried to distract him with one of his closest friends. We get back to Peter, because uh, letter A, Peter gave a rebuke. Already a little surprised at that when we think about it. When the Lord told his disciples of the events in the near future, Peter couldn't stay silent. Be it far from thee, Lord, he insisted. This shall not be unto thee. It's astounding to think of Peter attempting to rebuke the Lord of the universe. But don't we do that too? As I meditated on that, you know, it's kind of like, uh, not so, Lord. You know, you can't be doing that. You know, we don't, we don't think you can do that. It just can't be. Why would you do that? Well, we might mean well, when we're doing that, you know, why is, why is so-and-so sick and what's this going on? You know, that can't, you know, and we mean well. We would, certainly wouldn't wish ill on any, anybody. But Peter meant well. He truly loved Jesus and felt distressed to hear Jesus say he would be crucified. Isn't that ironic? Peter had just confessed that Jesus was the Christ. But when Jesus told his disciples directly of the events looming ahead, Peter became indignant at the prospect of losing his dearest friend. He refused to let it happen, come what may. At this time, Peter attempted to distract the Lord from the direction he needed to go. Strong's definition of the Greek word here, translated rebuke, is to, quote, to tax with fault, to rail, to chide, rebuke, reprove, censor severely, to admonish or to charge sharply. When addressing the Lord himself, this would seem to be outright disrespect. But as we have seen and will see again, Peter frequently spoke before he thought. Anybody else here besides me do that as well? It usually gets me in trouble when I do that. But we do that. We just, you know, we just want to speak out before we really have time to think about it. We really think about we're talking about Jesus Christ that way. Wow, you know, we'd all say, oh, we don't want to do that, yet we do it. Thank you, Peter, for your example. <laughs> Often, in our human wisdom, we think we know better than the Lord. While we may not say it out loud, our attitudes and our actions betray us. We know what Christ has said, but somehow we justify just going off in another direction. A popular piece of advice today is follow your heart. This, however, is a bad idea, a bad idea. As Christians, we are to follow God because our heart and feelings can deceive us. They're in the worksheet, Jeremiah 17, 9. Our heart is a deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Proverbs 3, 5 through 7. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto, thy, unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Throughout the Bible, many have argued to the Lord. This is not the way it's going to be. They've always found out differently. Yeah. <laughs> Cain brought an offering representing his own works, but the Lord would not accept it. Saul attempted to kill David, his God-chosen successor, in the end, Saul was killed in battle, and David became king. Later, David's son Absalom tried to take the kingdom from his father, but failed. Jeremiah decided to quit preaching, but the Lord wasn't finished with him. Jonah tried to flee from the presence of the Lord, but found himself in the belly of a fish. Now the Lord would teach Peter the same thing. 
and us, I'm afraid. You know? uh, even if he said it, it's going to happen, people. So, because we see Jesus then turned, and let her be Peter got a rebuke. Ouch. As the rest of the disciples looked on, Christ rebuked Peter. Get thee behind me, Satan. Coming from the Lord, that, you kind of think about that. Go, Whoa. You know, I've used that phrase, somebody trying to tempt me to do something. But, you know, Jesus saying that to me, that, 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 wow. Jesus told one of his closest friends and disciples, can you imagine how this must have stung Peter? What a way to show gratitude, Peter might have thought. After all, he'd only spoken out of love and concern. Or had he? You need to think about that. If we truly love someone, we will want for that person exactly what God wants. Nothing more and nothing less. Yeah. You know, we don't, we don't wish ill on anybody. And we don't, we don't you know, uh, want, want, want to pray that, uh, you know, something would be lifted from them or pray. But, you know, we do that and that's okay. But we should always keep in mind, but it's in God's will. If God will it, then good. Because we want God's will in their lives, even if it involves some suffering. As we said before, Satan's desire is to get God's people off track, even if only slightly. If Jesus had listened to Peter, he wouldn't have gone to Jerusalem and died on the cross for mankind's sin. Had Peter succeeded in preventing this, Satan would have had a great triumph. So in the real sense, whatever his intentions were, Peter truly had spoken the voice of Satan. Therefore, he had spoken with the voice of Satan. Therefore, he deserved the strongest rebuke the Lord could give. Remember, Jesus had directly encountered Satan previously. He'd already experienced that firsthand, you know, when Satan took him up and said, I'll give you this and do this. And the temptation in the wilderness. On this occasion, Satan had tried to distract Jesus from what he came to do. The three temptations Satan had for Jesus may not have seemed so diabolical on the surface, but Satan will never direct one into the way that pleases God. Had Jesus listened to Satan, even when Satan quoted scripture, he would have been going against God. Because somebody comes preaches at us doesn't mean that's what God has for us right then. So Jesus understood it was the voice of Satan when he heard Peter say, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. And immediately he rebuked his greatest enemy, who was perhaps his greatest friend, using his greatest friend. But Jesus' rebuke went even further, piercing Peter's heart. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Webster's Dictionary definition of, for the word savor is to like or to delight in, to favor. In essence, Jesus was telling Peter that he did not like or delight in the things of God. Wow. You know, again, Peter meant well, you know, wanted to protect his friend. All of a sudden, he just, I'm sure, rocked back on his heels. Just how strong Jesus responded to that. How often, I wonder, did Peter remember those words in the coming years? You know, when you really get corrected by somebody and somebody you love, it kind of tends to stick with you, doesn't it? He knew how many times he had disappointed the Lord. But that stern reboot would probably recall the time he actually tried to talk the Lord out of his father's mission. It had to be one of his biggest regrets. In our life, the devil will attempt to dissuade us from following Christ, even in the small areas. But we are to resist the devil. There on your worksheet, James 4, 7, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Ephesians 4, 27, neither give place to the devil. Don't even let him crack the door, crack the window on you. you know. No one enjoys being rebuked because we're naturally full of pride. We hate to admit it when we're wrong, yet the word of God teaches us how to respond and how not to respond when we are rebuked. Proverbs 9, 8 and 9, Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. 
Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will yet be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. Wow. Sometimes it takes that tougher stuff to help us grow and to learn and, and to be better. You know, if we just always got our way and didn't accept criticism, we'd, we'd stay who we are. <laughs> and we shouldn't want to do that. We need to want to grow. You may have heard this story, how of a teenager in the minor leagues uh, became discouraged with his progress and he wanted to quit baseball completely. He expected some sympathy from his father, but instead he got a jarring rebuke. Okay, if that's all the guts you've got, you might as well come home with me right now and begin working in the mines. Well, Mickey Mantle decided to stick it out. <laughs> He went on to play 18 seasons with the New York Yankees, during which they won seven world championships, and at the time of his retirement, stood third on the all-time home run list. And I love that. Mickey Mantle was one of my child. The reason I even tried to play baseball was because of Mickey Mantle. You know, I had a cousin steal my Mickey Mantle uh, baseball card, but that's all right. <laughs> Actually, my mother gave it away. That was one of my big arguments with my mother, let me tell you. Anyway. Don't go to college and leave your stuff, kids. I mean, you know, <laughs> hide it, really. Anyway, uh, yeah, because Peter accepted the Lord's rebuke and maintained his love and loyalty for the Savior, he went on to be powerfully used of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, and he brought the gospel to the Gentiles, as well as wrote the epistles of First and Second Peter. Instead of naturally bristling in pride when we are rebuked, we must learn to accept and grow from it, just as Peter did. In the verses immediately following Peter's rebuke, the Lord reiterated the necessity of complete self-denial to follow him. So we will experience on number three, denial for duty. Denial for duty. It's easy to take the path of least resistance giving in to the pressure and requests of the world. But often, as a believer, we must firmly say no. Just, you know, first, kids, first word kids learn, I think, is no. Sometimes we forget that as adults. Say no. The Bible is filled with examples of standing firm against the pull of temptation. When Christ was tempted in the wilderness, he repeatedly said no to the temptations and offers of Satan. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would not worship the king's golden ring, despite our golden image, despite the threat of a fiery furnace. Daniel refused to cease praying to the Lord God, even when he faced the lion's den. Earlier, all four denied following the king's prescribed diet, despite incredible pressure. They were determined to follow God's will. Standing against the world's pressure is not easy. Only through a close relationship with the Lord do we have the stability and the power to remain steadfast. We need him. You say it over and over. Got to have a relationship with him to withstand the pressures that we get out there. Psalm 16, 8 on the worksheet says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Wow. That's the attitude we need to have. I'm not going to get moved off this book. I don't care how hard you push yeah. or pull. Yeah, the following passages teach one of the greatest principles any Christian could learn. Devotion to duty requires denial of self. Christ was attempting to teach Peter and the other disciples that they must live always with a higher calling in mind. Trying to get to higher ground as we sing. We are not left on this earth to indulge ourselves but rather to serve the Lord. Two verses there on the worksheet, Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. 2 Corinthians 5.14 and 15. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And he that died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him 
which died for them and rose again. It is our Christian duty to deny self, the flesh with the affections and lusts, and to follow and obey the Lord wholeheartedly. Look at Galatians 5.24. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. So, letter A, don't live for today. Or for instance, don't live for today. The world says, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Solomon wrote as much at one point before he had analyzed everything to come to the conclusion of the whole matter. When I commend, he said, then I commended mirth, because a man hath no better thing under the sun than to eat and to drink and to be merry. And then he got to the end and found it all vanity. This was the conclusion of the foolish rich man in one of Christ's parables. He indulgently planned to build bigger barns for his abundance and then enjoy a leisurely future. It's there in the worksheet, uh, Luke 12, 16 through 21. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods and laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thou, thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So, is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. In neither case was eat, drink, and marry, be merry the way of God. We are not to live for today only. In the grand scheme of things, today is a short and insignificant period of time. When we live for the moment, what do we really have once it's over? And I'm sorry to football fans, but I had to just think of that this morning. You know, and I thought, I go, well, that's a, you know, uh, I'd have a favorite team, might care. What difference does it make come 10 o'clock tonight? Yes, right. You know, what's it change? You change your life any? Maybe you won 20 bucks, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I hope not, but <laughs> and I don't hope you lose either. But it's just that bad, you know, what, what is important to us? You know, what is really, what is our priority? James 4, 14 there says, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanish away. The psalmist also speaks of the brevity of life, and he concludes that it should motivate us to invest our lives in wisdom. Psalm 90, uh, verse 10 and 12 there, on the worksheet, it says, The days of our years are threescore years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is there strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Wow. Just don't, we can work, we can work, work until we're 80. Thank you, Charlie, for working beyond that. Yes, you know, but what's really important is to seek wisdom from God. The disciples were now aware of the details of the coming days. In the verses immediately following, surely thoughts of their Savior's impending crucifixion, Peter's rebuke, and in their own commitment to Christ were pressing in their minds as they listened to Jesus teach them. Mark 8, 34 through 7 says, And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Peter and the rest of the disciples were learning to live with the right priorities. In our lives, instead of living for today, let's live with the eternity's values in view. Keep our focus on them. So, we have letter B, 
Do live for tomorrow. Do live for tomorrow. In the light of eternity, our lifespan is extremely brief. As the great missionary explorer David Livingstone observed, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That's really the only thing we're taking with us. <laughs> our emphasis should be to invest our lives in that which will last for eternity. On the worksheet, John 6, 27. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. And Matthew 6, 31 through 3, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We'll find righteousness and life and honor that we started with. We know that God inhabits eternity and is himself eternal. Therefore, what is important in eternity is important to God and consequently should be important to us. That's what really matters and that's what he's really after. That's what should be important. We could say eternity consists of all the tomorrows that there will ever be. Make today count by spending it for tomorrow. Today, you are wisely investing the talents and resources the Lord has given you. Today, are you serving others? In heaven, it won't matter how much fun you had, how much money you made, or how fancy your house was or who won Super Bowl 55. All that will matter is what you did for the Lord. Jesus teaches Peter here that to lose his life for Christ's sake and for the gospel is really saving it. Peter was learning the value of a soul. Christ was willing to suffer a horrible death by crucifixion so that souls could be saved. His desire was to submit to the will of him that sent him. Our priority too should be to, to obey and follow God's will. John 6, 38, there on the worksheet. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And Jesus sends us forth just like that. Should not his greatest desire also be ours? So in conclusion, here we have another vital part of the education of a disciple. As the Lord described the details of his impending death, Peter's mind must have been reeling. Peter had just confessed Jesus was the Christ, and now he thought he was to accept that his Lord would experience a gruesome death. Not if he could help it. And Peter, without thinking it through, began to correct the Lord. But when Jesus firmly rebuked him, Peter learned a lesson in priorities. While the Lord knew going to the cross would not be easy, his priority was to follow his father and not take the comfortable road or even the conquering road at that time that he should take, uh, not that Peter thought he should take. As we see, Peter learning what his priority should be, we realize God has a plan for every believer. It's only when we follow it that we find the fulfillment that God has planned for our life. For a Christian to seek contentment outside the will of God is folly. The Bible would tell us foolishness. It will never be found elsewhere. For us to do his will, we must die to self and deliberately choose to make God's will the number one priority in our life. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, we thank you. Uh, we thank you for some of these hard lessons, Lord, and, and, and hard preaching. But, oh, Lord, we just need to hear. We need to hear of the wonderful example that Peter gives us of, of just speaking without thinking, and, but of learning and growing and always pursuing you and pursuing righteousness. Lord, I pray for us that you'd help us uh, just to keep our priorities, stay obedient to you, to, to follow your will. Lord, to seek it out and to uh, pursue it with all our hearts. 
Keep us strong, I pray, as, as we see the world in, in